Hello, thank you for coming along. Um, this is really loud if you stand down the front. Um, yeah, my name's Andrew Harmel Law. Um, I'm really pleased that everybody's come along to my talk. It's not got the most descriptive title. Um, the abstract was a bit um, confusing as well to some people, but um, hopefully what I'm going to talk about in the next 50 minutes um, makes sense to some people here, resonates with some people. Um, a little bit about myself, because the slide deck had a thing which implied that you should s describe, you know, say who you were. So I'm uh, Andrew Harmel Law, like I just said. I'm a dev lead or a developer or an open source advocate or just someone who likes building stuff. Um, that's my job. I work at Capgemini, which is a consultancy which loads of people haven't heard of. Um, but we're just like most other consultancies. So we do, I work in the custom software development bit. So we um, build complicated stuff for other people, basically. So... Uh, um, generally, they'll know they need an IT system to do something, and they won't have the investment in developer resource, so they'll pay us and we'll come along and do it for them. Um, and so this is my presentation. So I thought, to remind myself to keep coming back to this, um, I put in a too long, didn't listen slide at the start, which was my last minute edition. Um, and so the, the, the distilled down summary version of this talk is, I think we're engineering ourselves into a mess, and I include myself in that. Um, we're a right mess, as it says there. But I think we can engineer ourselves out of it. And as an engineer, or well, a software developer engineer is a bit of a grand term, I think that's good. I think that means we can, we can make things better. Um, so I put this disclaimer in before, because I first delivered this presentation internally at work um, as a kind of uh, alarm bell to people. Um, so, that was internal because lots of people internally at CAP like reading hype cycles and magic quadrants and technology radars and stuff. This hadn't come from any of those things. This has come from me going to conferences like the Java Posse Roundup, um, speaking to people, reading blog posts, just following stuff that was happening, listening to podcasts, all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is, the disclaimer is, um, I've just spent two days in an unconference where you're not supposed to lecture um, and everyone sits around in a circle and it's a big discussion, so my mind is completely in that way of doing things. So standing at the front with a bunch of people looking at me is a bit terrifying. Um, so I don't know if it will work, but if people do want to ask questions as we go, and I think if you ask a question, you put your hand up and then I repeat the question and then we can maybe talk about it a little bit, that might be quite good because I don't want to lose anyone or fail to make a point or, or make some, say something is quite controversial that people don't agree with. So it, it would be good for me, without having a fight, because that would be a bit upsetting, if anyone wants to ask any questions as we go. So that's the theory. Um, the genesis for this talk came, it had been bubbling around in my head for a long time, but it came, from, came to the surface when this appeared on the front page of The Guardian in, on the 24th of August last year. Um, and at that point, something had gone wrong in the NASDAQ stock exchange, and I think it went wrong by slowing down as opposed to spectacularly blowing up. Um, and as a result, loads of other systems had fallen over, and it wasn't just at NASDAQ. There were lots of other systems that were connected to it in other organizations, and the, the kind of knock-on effects were pretty catastrophic, and I think it brought the NASDAQ down for a few days. But as it says at the top, a series of system crashes affecting Google, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft had been noticed. So people like my wife, who is an HR person and a driving instructor and a mum was aware and typically we're the people who get aware of these things. Um, as is usually the case in most mainstream journalism, their understanding of and diagnosis of the reasons why things had happened was kind of almost completely wrong um, from what I read elsewhere and the technical aspects of it on the web. But the thing that, that struck me most and that really resonated was this quote that they, that they had. And so um, the quote is, which you can probably read for yourselves, and they also fail in ways that are beyond the comprehension of a single person. I think that's true, but what I want to argue is that they failed, the systems failed in a way that were beyond the comprehension of a single person before the event occurred. So I think we all think we build systems that are resilient and available and, and scale and all that kind of stuff, and then they fail in a weird and wonderful way that nobody could have foreseen. When it happens, I've worked on systems, and you go, crikey, this thing falling over and, and then made that thing go slow, and then it had a knock-on effect on seven systems which made this fall over. That's obvious with hindsight, but when you get asked by your manager or the client, why did you not foresee that? You didn't foresee it. So, and so this is, this is the doom 
laden bit, and then hopefully we'll go into the ways we can get ourselves out of it. So the reason this is happening is because complexity is on the increase. So we, all of us, engineer systems that have bigger and bigger scale, which can deal with bigger and bigger volumes, and it can go to more and more devices. We're trying to access more and more systems more of the time. Luckily for me, Dan mentioned in his keynote things about the fact that we're building these systems with teams that are spread across multiple time zones and with multiple teams speaking multiple languages. All of these things, it's getting more and more complicated. And so when things get more and more complicated, the individual bits, even if we succeed as engineers to build the individual pieces in a simple way, the combination of not many simple pieces makes something that's complex. And if you add a few more to that, and literally a few more, the possible things that could happen gets completely out of control. And you get things like chaos and unpredictability and emergent behavior, which nobody, you know, with hindsight, is very obvious. But prior to the thing happening, it's very difficult to foresee. So that's one thing, and I think that's, we've got ourselves in that situation, knowingly or unknowingly. The other thing, which is also good, because Dan kind of alluded to it in his um, keynote, um, I think the underpinnings of what we do are changing as well. So I, like Dan, was around in, in 2000 and 1999, so dot-com one. When .com1 was happening, you'd need to get like, you know, you'd have to build a big team of staff and lots of developers, and you'd have to go to Sun, where I worked at the time, and get lots of servers and, and loads of disk and all this kind of stuff to scale up just in case you were very successful when you went IPO or when you first launched, so that you could deal with the traffic spikes. Now, three people teams can get to like multi-million pound or multi-million dollar organizations with still three people owning none of their own hardware and it's all running somewhere in a cloud that's owned by someone else and they're just paying a kind of a fee. So that, that what, what I mean by the changing underpinnings are it used to be those things used to be expensive and now they're cheap. Things that used to be easy or it used to be hard sorry like starting up a, you know, a big software company you don't are now easy three people can do it and there's lots of examples on the internet of all that kind of stuff. Conversely Things that used to be easy are now difficult. So people used to take for granted that they owned their own servers because you had them because they were in a big rack and you paid a lot of money for them. Um, but now they're not. They're off somewhere else. So you don't have that control. Um, cooling used to be easy. Nobody used to, when I first started, no one worried how hot a chip ran. Now, the fact that your CPU speed was the big thing. Now, it's not so worry, much of a worry about CPU speed. It's like how many CPUs you've got and how much heat they're pumping out and all of this kind of stuff. Um, Lots of stuff, All of the, almost in every single sphere of what we do, I would argue that um, the things we used to take for granted when I started 15 years ago are now not true. They're almost all completely opposite. So what does this mean for us as software developers? So I think it means it's just got exciting. That's the argument. So here's what I think is the nub of the problem. And this is why I think we are the problem and the way we work. So I think when we see a problem, we see the problem and we go, that's a problem, and we look into it in more detail because of the way we work and the way we're wired. We identify it and then we solve it. So if, there's, you know, if we've got one server and it's a single point of failure, so, and, and if that blows up that server, then we'll put two of them in. If development's too slow, we'll hire more developers so we'll, you know, and we'll scale up the process to figure out all how to work with that. If there's too many bugs getting into prod, we'll do more testing because that's the way to solve that problem. And those things in turn will cause more problems. So we're now we've got more than one server. So now that if, if a request comes in for the first part of my session, we'll serve it from server A. But then the same request comes in for a later part of the user journey. And it's gone to server B. Server B needs to know about the user session that server A initiated. So you've got to start clustering and all this kind of stuff. But that's fine, because we're engineers, so we solve it by clustering. But the problem is, there's been a lot of problems. And we're building a lot of stuff, and we're going to a lot of scale. And I think you end up here. So in my head, it feels like flying buttresses on top of flying buttresses on top of flying buttresses. And I think that's us standing in the middle of it. And it feels quite secure. But if one thing breaks, the knock-on effect can be spectacular and unpredictable and not pretty to be around. Because I've been around a few and they've gone south. And so that, that's the question. I think we're part of the problem. And I include myself in this as well. So this isn't an accusatory thing. So that, I got to that point, and I thought, so we're, you know, just if we're part of the problem, well, this, this isn't a good thing. We need to, you know, I still enjoy writing software, so I don't want this to be the reason why I stop writing software. I want this to be the reason why we make things different. 
And at the time, we still are, but at the time we were trying to hire lots more developers, and, and as everybody is at the moment, um, because we needed to scale up, because lots of people wanted us to, bu to build stuff for them. And so in the interview process, we would say, that's all very well, because we speak to lots of people who are quite junior, so we, we'd, the people who had the experience already had the job. So we were speaking to the people who didn't have the experience, but they had the enthusiasm and the bedroom version of all of the skills. And we would say to them, that's great, but if you're no, no, now no longer in your bedroom and we're doing it with a massive 40-man team and half of them are in India and half of them are in the UK and some of them might be up in Nairn in Scotland and, and they're spread around and it's, you know, all of these, we've layered all these complexities on it and that's what we call enterprise development. How are you going to cope with that? But I, what I realised was, having realised all of this other stuff, um, perhaps we should be looking at them to figure out how we can learn from them. Because they, three-man teams, managed to build amazing stuff that we think we should throw 300 people at. So we'd, we got things the wrong way around. I also, at the same time, had been on a cruise, even though I don't look like I'm 80, and I'd read a book about natural farming. So this, you've got to stay with me here for this bit. Um, a book about natural farming written in 1975 by a Japanese guy. So natural farming... And this is, you can get it on the internet for free. It's ludicrously interesting if you grew up in the country like I did. Um, and so what this guy, Masanobu Fukuoka, had done was he'd um, taken a look at agriculture and figured out that the way to get the most effective things out of the system of agriculture and of growing things was to stop doing things that people had learned to do by do, doing less of the things that people had learned how to do or by taking things away. So rather than adding stuff, seeing a problem, oh, we've got, you know, there's a new insect which is coming from, you know, Eastern Europe. We're going to have to, you know, lay out a new, you know, round of, 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 um, of pesticides. Or um, if we, you know, if we give, you know, one inch extra to all of our pigs in a big barn, it turns out that the meat is 60% more tasty and all this kind of stuff. He stopped looking at it like that from within the system. He stepped back. And so he looked at the process of growing crops from the ground up. So he'd literally returned to the roots. And it's, it's a, maybe you won't go and read it, but I thought it was a ludicrously interesting book. Um, and I think, so this is the other thing, none of the things I'm going to talk about, the next five things, the five whys, I haven't come up with. They're just things that I've kind of spotted and, and read around on the internet, but I feel they kind of tie together into this theme. I think we're seeing his way of thinking appearing in IT and in what we do. And I think this way of thinking is something that we can apply to the things that we do now to solve other problems. So, stop. So number one, I've just told a bunch of people who work in IT that a book about farming from 1975 um, is a really good place to go to learn about how we should change how we work. Um, that sounds a bit bonkers. But the examples we're going to talk about are from places like eBay, Google, Netflix, etc. So I'm guessing that if they're doing it, and most of them didn't appear yesterday as well, so this is a fundamental thing. They're, they're out in Silicon Valley, they're thinking differently, but Netflix has been around since 1998. Google's been around for a long time, Flickr, Amazon. So they've got the, as much of a legacy problem and as much of an old way of thinking problem as we've got. So, that's, so I think that means that they're a, kind of a reasonable set of, pe of, of, kind of case studies to look at. And the case studies are, because they've all come from California, have got brilliant names, which is the best bit about the presentation. So we'll go through each of them quickly, um, just in enough detail to kind of explain them, hopefully enough to draw the conclusions. You can read tons and tons about them. If you think they're interesting on the internet, there's loads about all of these things. Some of them there's stacks about. Um, but the first one is the bakery and no-ops. So um, the bakery and no-ops is about confronting the problem that us changing things makes stuff break. So, and Netflix, which is the hub of lots of the stuff I'm going to talk about, because they're very open and public about what they do. Um, Netflix um, kind of went along a journey that, that got them to what they called the bakery. Um, so when they were obviously moved loads of their infrastructure to AWS, and they realized that they needed to be very public about how they cope with things when it went wrong. So they um, described how they coped with that. And there's one called the Christmas Eve outage. They described how they coped with that. There's another one called the AWS degradation. They described how they coped with that. Um, basically, in most of the cases, some human being had changed something by accident, like Dan accidentally typing into the wrong command window, which I may or may not have done in my career. 
Um, or something automatic which someone had written, which they went, this is always going to happen at, at midnight, but it turns out that time zones, you know, if you deploy something to a different place, midnight might not be the same time, or leap seconds came into play, or, you know, things like that. Stuff goes wrong. Stuff breaks when things change. So this is our first one store revolution slide. So if we were thinking about this abstractly and not thinking about this from, a, from the, 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 the aspect of IT, and we had a nice calming picture of a field of corn, what might you think? If you take a long enough time to try and cram loads of things, uh, metaphors into a book about farming, you will come up with the idea that immutability makes lots of things easier. So we know immutability for things like multi-threading, we know immutability makes things easier. If we're doing development, so things like no changes in a sprint, if I'm a developer, when now that people can say that and everyone knows what it means, that makes my life a thousand times easier. Caching, if we're caching, if things can't change when they're in the cache and you don't have to invalidate things, that's a lot easier. If anyone can remember Sunrays, which I'm dancing over a bit, but Sunrays were an immutable thin client device, which was really cheap. And so if it broke, you wouldn't try and fix it. You'd unplug it and you'd plug in a new one. And it was a million times cheaper, not a million, significantly cheaper than paying a guy to come and fix someone's desktop. So it was, they had immutability. And scaling. So it, uh, Facebook, for example, I think they've got three server types. And when you build a new system, you can, you can platform it on some or all of those three server types. You don't get to come up with your own one, with your own spec and your own certain you know, size of, of memory cards and CPU sizes and number of disk bays. There are three. So they know it's either A, B, or C. So what Netflix did was they thought, what if you had immutable deployables? So they took it just to the next step. And if you deployed those immutable deployables to immutable environments, so the next bit, I'm going to fly through this because there's lots of words, but you can read all of it on the, the link at the bottom of the blog post. Um, so this is an Adrian Cockroft blog, um, and he called Ops, DevOps, and NoOps at Netflix. Um, and basically it upset a lot of people, but the interest, because he said NoOps, he said um, Netflix is a developer-oriented culture. They realized that because they're developers all the way down, and they've kind of figured out the way of doing development because they'd applied lots of agile practices and stuff. Why didn't they push that further down? So they took all the tools that they used and they just pushed them right down to the, the kind of deploying of things into live, which they called the bakery. And then they let the developers self-serve using those tools. So I reckon the reason this is applicable to us is because, because they've done so much research and development about it and, and kind of figured out the ways that things work, I think most of us here, probably our companies, could do something similar or start moving towards it. So I'm not going to say we should all like push things to live because that might cause a bit of trouble with various people. But lots of the things they do can be taken. Another presentation. So this is from Carl Quinn, um, who talked at InfoQ uh, QCon about the bakery. But this is a little bit about how they do it. So they've got um, base AMIs at the top, which are just. Um, I think at the time it was Ubuntu, and on top of that they put Apache, Java, and Tomcat, and that was it. Fixed versions, nothing else. Then they'd already bu built their um, archives, their wars, and they put them in Artifactory, and I think they packaged them with YUM into RPMs. Um, and then, so they would go into the bakery, it would mount the AMI that they wanted, it would in automatically install the bits they wanted, and then it would get baked into an AMI, which they could then deploy. And the important bit is they took a snapshot of it. So if things did accidentally change, they'd roll it back because they wanted to ignore all the changes that had been made by accident or a human being or a process that had gone rogue or anything. They wanted to be always the thing that got baked. They then had a web-based tool which let the developers push these AMIs out into live traffic. So this is Asgard. There's a presentation about Asgard that you can read about. It's open source and you can get your hands on it. But this is how it worked. So you'd take your machine images, and this goes too fast for me to talk, but... Um, you can push your machine images into Prod, which is what they do at, Amazon, uh, at Netflix, um, and then put some live traffic through it. So there's like 99 old version of, the, of your app running and one version of the new one. You push some live traffic through it. If it goes bad and he cries, you back it out. If it goes well, you dial it up. So maybe you put a few more instances in until you slowly retire all of the old versions of the service and you put in a whole load of new versions of the service in. And that's totally self-served by the developers. So that's quite good. And I know there's a lot of downsides, which we can discuss at the end, hopefully, if we get a chance. Um, so number two also comes from Netflix. And I think this is more famous. I think a lot of people have probably already heard of this. 
it's anti-fragility in the Simeon army. So if we know that stuff goes wrong when we change things or things change things, it doesn't cover all the failures because some stuff just breaks just because it breaks. So a CPU might blow up just because of the, the effects of time. So it's just been around for a long time and it just breaks. So all of the bakery stuff and all of the immutability stuff isn't going to solve this problem for us. So failure is inevitable. So we need to, to cope with failure as well. So there's a really interesting paper that Netflix put out, which was Adrian Cockcroft and another author who I can't remember, but I think his name checked later on. Um, they wrote this paper based on the book Anti-Fragile by Nicholas Tassim Taleb, I think is how you pronounce his name, who wrote The Black Swan. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So what they did do was they looked at the ways you could cope with failure. So number one is you duplicate it. And that's what we do now. So everybody does this. I'm sure everyone does this. So we would create a test environment or multiple test environments. Where I work, we've got loads of test environments. You create exhaustive test suites. You create uh, automated test suites. You create environments where really bright testers can try and break things in wonderful ways that I, as a developer, have never thought of. Um, you do performance tests. You do scalability tests. You do as many tests as you can think. The problem they realized was this doesn't scale. And the point of the picture of thousands of babies is that it doesn't scale to human beings because if you want to get more coverage up to a certain point it's the human beings that you need to add not the extra environments environments have become easy but adding human beings has become hard so option two because we're now in the world of, of big data and things you could capture lots of data and you could model things but the conclusion they came to and they're bright people so i'm going to agree with what they said um we're not that clever yet to figure out from all of these myriad possibilities of what could go wrong to you know, figure out which ones to, to look at. So the option that they came to was put all your eggs in one basket and then watch all those eggs very carefully, which isn't what they said, but that's an Andrew Carnegie quote that's on the side of the um, Scottish Parliament, um, and I thought it summed it up quite well. Um, at this point, all of my management were going, that's that sounds horrific. We seem to be we're throwing out all of the good stuff we do, which was option A. And if you read the blog post that I listed at the start, they don't. They say that all of the stuff we do, all of the good engineering to build an app with redundancy and fault tolerance and all that kind of stuff, that's good. Nobody's saying that's bad. We should keep doing that. Um, and do it service-oriented and microservice-based and all of the good things that we now do keep going. But what did they do on top? So again, calming picture of a field of corn. Um, but here, you'll notice, slightly stormy clouds, wind is blowing the corn, so this is to remind me that it's, it's left alone. The farmer's not in there with like a, you know, trying to stop the wind blowing the corn. What they do is they embrace the chaos, or the far, and the farmers just sit there and hope it doesn't blow over. But at Netflix, what you do is the best animated GIF I've ever seen. So that's what Netflix do. Netflix makes stuff break on purpose. What Netflix also do is they make it break on purpose in prod, and, and nobody, even the most enlightened person I've ever spoken to in the UK has thought that would be a good idea at the moment, but you can do it in other environments, so we try and do it in other environments. Um, but the quote from Adrian is, um, reduce uncertainty by regularly in inducing failure. By increasing the frequency of failure, it reduces its uncertainty. And the interesting thing is, what you learn most is that when stuff goes wrong, things break, but the things that make it really bad is the panic that happens around about something going wrong. So again, to Dan's point, the thing was probably made a lot better when he accidentally brought down the DB server by someone not panicking and helping him sort it out. Typically, very senior people are staring over my shoulder while I sit and try and remember Vi commands. That doesn't help. So what they do is they just they normalize failure and they normalize the coping and the, the responding to the failure so that people get used to the fact. They don't think, oh, if that, I really hope that that doesn't break. That's clever, I think. What they do this with is a thing called, or a group of, of processes which are called the Simeon Army, which I'm sure most people have probably heard of. So I'm not going to go into the detail. You can read tons about them. They're open source. You can download them. I think they're built, written for AWS, so they use the REST APIs for AWS, but I think people have ported them to other cloud stacks, like OpenStack and things. Um, but you can also just do it manually. So the, the idea that they got was from the game days that Amazon do, and game days was Jeff Bezos would come in and turn off servers at random, and they'd have to try and figure out what broke. Um, the thing that is worth discussing very quickly, or, or mentioning very quickly, Chaos Monkey's the little guy at the bottom, 
that was the first one they built, which was in their imagination was a little monkey with machine guns running around in the data center, shooting up um, individual server instances and pulling out network cables. Um, that was good. They then ad added latency monkey, and, and when you read around this a bit, that's the real one that tells them lots of interesting stuff. So latency monkey adds latency between two instances of, of whatever piece of the system. That makes stuff go spectacularly wrong because everybody thinks everything's okay because everyone's monitoring the systems and not the latency between the systems. That's when it breaks horribly. Um, they've also got things like conformity monkey. So conformity monkey finds um, machine images which, despite their bakery process, have stopped looking like they ought to look because they baked it. So they know what the what, you know what the, the settings and configuration and all the parameters from the environment should look like. Finds them and turns them off. Janitor monkey finds ones which are um, correct but not doing anything. Turns them off. So that's how they elastically scale. And uh, doctor monkey looks for unhealthy things as well. So they've got lots of monitoring, and if it's unhealthy, turns it off. So I totally recommend you read about that, because even the concepts, even if you can't run one of these in any of your environments, the, pro, the, the, the theory behind it and the, the concepts are very interesting. Um, number three. So this one's quite quick. Um, number three is throw everything away, or when I presented it internally, everything? Yes, everything. And you need to do it regularly as well. So... Most, or lots of people, more, than, more people should read Fred Brooks' Mythical Man Month. Um, and there's lots of nuggets of information in there, but one is that he says, plan to throw one away. So he wrote that from a product perspective, and he was saying, if you're writing a new product, in your plan should be the, 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 the developing of the product, and then when you finish, you throw it away and you develop it again. So you've got that time in your plan. I have never worked on a project where that is the case, because people pay us to write software, and they look at the plan and go, right, that doesn't seem, I'm paying you to throw stuff away. That doesn't seem like any good. Um, but I don't think any, most people don't either. So what we do is we build stuff and then the code slowly rots because we're trying to go as fast as we can. A small change over here starts making weird things break over there. And you try and fix it and you refactor it, but little things start creeping in. Or then something that used to take a day now starts taking three weeks to change. And developers, as a result, become more expert in the code base. So it's the bit that, that Neil knows about. So Neil is the only guy who fixes these things um, because Neil knows. And Neil knows at least it takes a week for Neil to do it, or if it takes me three weeks to do it. Um, Neil gets pissed off because the only thing Neil does is moving um, buttons around on a screen for a VB6 app from there to there because it's more difficult than it ought to be. Neil gets peed off and leaves. So now we all have to cope with the fact that we all don't really know about this bit of the code base because Neil was the guy who'd taken the bullet for the rest of us. And it just doesn't get any better. So, a less calming version of a picture from the book. Um, but this one is the old fertilizers, the new. So in um, One Straw Revolution, they harvest crops. So they still harvest crops, that's obvious, because they need to like, eat the food and things. But what they do is, when they harvest the crops, they don't clear the fields. They leave the remains of the crops on the fields as the fertilizer for the next generation of the crops. Um, and they also don't harvest all the crops at the same time, so we'll get back to that in a second. Um, what this could mean for us is, what if we were always throwing things away, but we threw away little bits at a time, as opposed to Fred Brooks's, like, admittedly, a long time ago, so he's very prescient, so I'm not going to slag him off, um, but little bits at a time. And the fundamental thing is that, that I think was maybe more implicit when Fred said it, because people would understand, but we're only throwing away the ASCII implementation. And this was what Fred was saying. By writing a system, we learn tons and tons about the system. Um, and that's the important bit. There's two things that come out, in my opinion, out of development. There's the system itself, the ASCII code, but there's also the understanding in the development team of how the system is supposed to work, especially in my world, because we build things for other people. I need to learn as much as I can about the domain of the people I'm working for as possible. And by definition, I probably don't know that much about it. And if I wandered in... Assuming I did, I'd probably get taught pretty quickly that I didn't. And ideally, if we've worked really well and you've got like behavior-driven tests or really nice kind of stories and all that kind of stuff, you're also not throwing out the specs. And if you've got nice APIs, if you're doing microservices, you're not throwing out your APIs, hopefully. So you're just throwing out stuff behind the scenes. Um, and so this, that is something that we have managed to do. And we can also rebrand it as refactoring. Because if it's small 
and it's in a microservice-based architecture, it's just, we'll just look at this thing in a bit more detail and we'll see if we can make it go a bit faster, or be a bit better, or be a bit more monitorable or something. Which may be throwing out the 300 lines of code, which is that individual microservice, and implementing them in a different language or sitting on a different platform or something. So. And this, this is, so this is one of the ones where I've made a slight leap of faith. The conclusions for this came from me from not reading about what Netflix do, but by speaking to guys at Netflix. Um, so they do this lots. I've been told by them that they know other people who work at lots of these other places that they do similar things. Maybe not in some of the core systems, because obviously they're like the crown jewels and there'll be lots more um, ceremony around about all of those things. But this is how some of these big companies, despite the fact that they, must, they could potentially have horrific legacy code bases, in many areas, or in some cases, most areas, they don't have a legacy problem. And I've been on projects for two years and we've got a legacy problem. I've been on projects for six months and you've got a legacy problem. So that, to me, is very interesting. So number four, I stopped reading Netflix blogs for number four, and I've actually read blogs from somewhere else. Although a, re a Netflix person recommended that I read a blog. Um, so this is the Church of Graphs, and it's from Etsy. So, and basically I'm paraphrasing the entire blog post. So again, I'm not, this isn't my idea, this is someone else's. Um, and the link to the blog post is in a few slides. Um, so the blog post starts off, this is a typical thing that we see. Or maybe we don't see, again to Dan's point, maybe this is the guys downstairs in support. So support C, it was all looking good until five minutes past four when something went badly wrong. And then at 20 minutes past four, someone must have done something to fix it. And then at uh, 30, 35 minutes past four, it was all good again and we could all go back to relaxing. Then, probably, everyone ran around trying to figure out what happened. Typically, and even like, so last week I was doing this, so I'm not, this is not to imply that we practice, or I practice everything that we preach. You start grepping through logs to find out what happened. And because we are, we think we're quite clever, so we've got microservices, so we've got lots of individual processes running on lots of different boxes, each doing lots of beautiful logging, and there's a lot of information. And if we're lucky, the clocks on all of the systems are the same, so that you can at least use time, <coughs> excuse me, time to tie up the fact that this happened over here and then this happened over there. And they're all, st <coughs> excuse me, they're all stateless, so possibly half of the problem happened on this server and then half of the problem happened on this server. So it gets ludicrously complicated. So it's time for another calming agricultural image to, uh, to show us the, the error of our ways. Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so hopefully by now you're getting the hang of this. Um, in the book, there's a few chapters where um, Fukuoka-san describes how people came, and he would invite them, scientists would come and say, you've made all these claims, this is insane. Nobody can, can not use fertilizers, because this is before the um, organic revolution. Nobody doesn't use fertilizers. Nobody um, does all of the things that you've been publicly talking about and gets these results. It doesn't happen. So they all came to study him. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but his point is, and he's been quite zen about this, so it might be a kind of Cohen, I am a zen master way of explaining it, but he pointed out that they all came with their pre... They had a system which they thought they could improve by learning things from his system. So they would come in with their, this is how we farm, or this is how we grow wheat, or this is how we get rid of a certain pest, and they would see that he didn't have that problem, and he'd go, okay, they don't have that problem because they grow, for like fertilizer, he grows a nitrogen... Um, trapping plant, so we should do that. So they'll take the small part of his solution, not the whole, small part, take it back into their world and then try it. And it was a bit effective, but it wasn't as effective as his solution. And they couldn't get their heads around why this would be. His point was, stop using your tools and your kind of, your, your tools, thought tools, so like, you know, scientific method and all that kind of stuff. Just take a step back and look. And that's the point of this one. So all of those people are obviously wishing they were up in an aeroplane looking down. And the point, I think, for us is the looking is important. For me, looking through lots and lots of logs, which are textual, is not the right way to get your head around a massive amount of data in a very small time. But our eyes are ludicrously good at spotting patterns when you do zoom out to a really high level. 
And if we can see the patterns, then we can hopefully see the reason why things failed. And if we're really good, we can see the things that are going to cause a failure before they even cause the failure. And so this is what Etsy have moved towards and now do all over the place. Um, so they say, if Etsy has a religion, it's the Church of Graphs, which is why I got the cool title for this talk, uh, for this section. If it moves, they track it. So they draw graphs of pretty much everything, and they've got loads of examples in their blog post, which we'll see in a minute. Um, but the interesting thing is as well, they're not changing everything. They still do what we all probably do. They measure at the network machine and application level. So we all do that. We put login code in. We've already got Nagios, things that hook into JMX and all that kind of stuff. So they're not throwing all the baby out with the bathwater, but they're changing things a bit. The one thing that they do, which we're trying to do at the moment, which to me seems blindingly obvious, but nobody ever seems to have done it, they draw a line on their graphs when they deploy new code. So if you have that, because they push code a lot and they're quite cocky about it, they might do it like 30 times a day, and we're like, crikey, every two weeks we get a release or something. But um, that makes that a lot more obvious to, to, you know, to almost anyone, because they'll be like, right, what was the chain set that went in at this point that obviously spectacularly broke stuff, and then obviously someone made a quick patch just before uh, and deployed it just before uh, 20 minutes past four, and then someone actually went in and properly fixed it. It's a lot more easy. You've narrowed down the things that you need to look at. They also point out that seeing things not going wrong is very reassuring. So they don't just monitor stuff because they know that they need to watch it because it might blow up. They monitor stuff which makes them feel good. So they monitor logins and login errors. They also monitor things that might be an early warning that something is going wrong that they might not have spotted. So here, they're looking at the new posts on the bugs forum, new posts on the help forum, and again, they're tracking it against code deploys. So that seems pretty clever. Um, they then go on to point out, and this is, this is the really clever bit that I think the, 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 the message for number four is, Application metrics are hard. So typically in the past, and I've done this, you try and figure out what the things you want to measure about the app are in advance, because then you'll know what it looks like when it's running, and you can figure out if stuff's going to blow up. Um, but they pointed out that as things change, and nowadays things change fast, and for these guys it changes 30 times a day, that's difficult. So what they did was they stopped making it... They just went the other way. They said, we can just measure everything. We already want to measure everything. So let's just make it ludicrously easy to measure as much stuff as possible. But even they admitted that they didn't get it. They didn't come up with that themselves. And so this is the, the interesting back in history thing. In 2008, Flickr put a blog post up about this stuff. So all the code hail metric stuff that we use in our projects and probably loads of guys here do, loads of other kind of counting and timing frameworks. It's not new. This stuff isn't new. It's come from stuff that these guys did in 2008 that maybe didn't have the kind of big ripple effect that it might do today. So... Um, <clears throat> yeah, so and that's the blog post to read at the bottom if you want to read that. So the last one um, is open source almost everything. So I've got 13 minutes left. So this is a bit different. So do a quick poll. Who here uses open source? That's almost everybody. Um, or probably everybody. Who here contributes to open source? So that means you can like fix documentation errors or write cool sets, maybe a third or a quarter. And who here creates open source? By that I mean like you push, you create a new GitHub repo. Okay, so that's maybe 20. Next poll, who here uses open source at work? So we use tons of it. Yeah, almost everybody. You can see where this is going. Who here contributes to open source at work? Knowingly, so that your boss knows you're doing it. Okay, so that's quite a lot less. Um, so that was great. I need to say for the camera, it's about 20 maybe. And who here creates open source at work? Kind of. It might be through obscurity that I'm getting away with it. This, isn't, this is recorded, so that's probably a bad thing to say. Um, so there's a blog post, another blog post. Do a lot of reading. Um, blog posts are good. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, Tom Preston Warner at the CEO or someone very high up in GitHub said, um, you should open source almost everything. Um, and he went into the details of why. So again, you can read the blog post if you so desire. Um, but to summarize, if you don't want to have to read it, um, it says it's great advertising for your company. You get more work done faster and more cheaply. You attract new talent. It's the best technical interview possible. By that, they mean if you get a pull request from someone, um, 
you can really see how the code looks and also if you interact with them because you need to tell them that they should use spaces instead of tabs, whether they get upset. Um, or or other, other indentation methods are, are, are available. Um, you retain your talent, you get effortless modularization and you reduce duplication of effort. So some of these I think is quite hard to disagree with. Effortless modular, modularization, if anything, is described as effortless. Uh, that smells like a bad smell to me because I have to do stuff and nothing is ever effortless. Um, but the problem is the person who's, who's suggesting that I open source stuff or that I put my reputation on the line and go to my client and go to my boss and say we should open source a bunch of this stuff, he runs GitHub. So if we put our stuff on GitHub, which is probably where we're going to put it, he's got a vested interest. So now I'm thinking, maybe that's not, you know, I don't know. Can I trust what he says? So what I do when I don't know who to trust, I go to Netflix. <laughs> because they talk about all this stuff a lot. So there's another presentation. You can find it um, on SlideShare this time uh, called Netflix Open Source Software. Who, what, where, when, why, how by Joe Sondown who's a very nice guy, and also does uh, Picard tips on Twitter, if you want to follow Joe. Um, so they said, hire and retain top engineers. Okay, so that's now we've got two, two people have said that. So now maybe it sounds like a good idea. Good PR, which is a bit more open and honest about, you know, so they, they're seen to be doing open source, right? Which is, that's that got to be good. Everyone likes that. A bit more selfishly, but again, 10 out of 10 for them for being honest, they think, and they've managed it, make Netflix standards open source standards. So they got a bit of flack at one point because everyone went, why are you putting all your eggs in one basket in the AWS space? They said, we're abstracting ourselves away from AWS by building all of the tools like the bakery and our, um, Asgard and, and all of these things. And we're making them open source so that hopefully someone else will port them to OpenStack and then if we need to, we can move because we're dependent on the tools, not on AWS. The next one, which I thought was really good, and you don't see this kind of stuff very often, not at a corporate level, they give back to the Apache OSS community because they've taken loads of stuff, right? Everything runs on Tomcat. They've, Java's underneath everything. There's loads of open source, which if they'd have had to build this from the bottom up or pay licenses for it back in 2000, you know, 1999, they would have, you know, they would have been a very different company. But the two that are interesting to me are Motivate and Peer Pressure, Code Cleanup and Documentation. I've got nine minutes left. So last audience poll. Um, who here would like to use open source at work? Uh, who here would like, oh sorry, I need to say that was almost everybody, I think. Who would like to contribute to open source at work? In your contract, so you know you're not going to get sued and everyone's going to be, <laughs> right, cool, that's almost everybody. And who would like to create open source at their work? That's maybe 50%, maybe a bit more. So that's my point. So I was, that was a risky thing, I thought. If, if nobody put their hands up, I'd, I'd disprove my own point. So this one, this is what the guy looks like now. Um, and this isn't in the book. So what was interesting to me was these scientists come in and they abuse him and they slag him off and say that he must be like some faker guy because he can't possibly be getting the results that he claims he's getting. So he just gets abuse. But he's very calm because he's very Japanese and Zen and just lets them keep coming and drawing their conclusions then going away. And by the sounds of it, he doesn't fight them off or anything. But he also gets lots of um, kind of Western looking for a Zen experience type people and they want to work in a farm and get back to nature and all that kind of stuff. And so they come and he lets them work on his farm um, and they do it for, he gives them accommodation and he feeds them and then they work for free. So it's a kind of quid pro quo thing. Um, but what was interesting to me was, and you can see it from reading the book, he seems to really enjoy giving stuff away and sharing the information. That, there's a real passion behind it. And I think that same passion is what drives lots of us as developers. So this is the worst picture I could find, which was Creative Commons, to say, what do I get? And that's why I think the last two bullet points are interesting. And this is the first time I'm going to speak about what really what we do. So we're trying to use or do the right thing with open source because, for, very, for lots of reasons, and there could be a Capgemini set of bullet points, but as, for me as a developer or as a guy who has to lead teams of, of, of X number of developers, you see, just like everyone put their hands up, you can see their eyes light up when you say, that's good, we've, got, we've now built seven of these pieces and there's another bunch of guys who are our colleagues who are working on another project and they've got a need for the thing we've built. We could, and to begin with, um, open source it internally. We could just share it with them and that's good. So now we're collaborating and that's one of the strap lines of, of our company 
we're really collaborating, but we're collaborating through code. So we might push out a, you know, something to an internal GitHub account we've got, and then they can use it, and then, then we get the benefits of code cleanup and better documentation and more eyes on it and more people using it and all that kind of stuff. But it's not just that. So that's our egos being massaged because other people are using my code. That's quite good. We also are getting ourselves over the not invented here mindset, which I would hate. I would love to say we don't have a cap because we're dead professional, but we do. So you think when you're on a project, your guys have come up with the greatest stuff, and the guys over there, even though last week you were working with them, are probably not as good as us. By sharing, and we use other people's stuff, and they use, excuse me, our stuff, it helps you get over stuff, and you've got more of a common goal. And it also, and this is the, the last bit, it becomes a great place to work. So people just enjoy it. Five minutes, it's gone bright red. Um, yeah, it just, people just enjoy it. It's very soft. Right in the business case, which I still haven't managed to do, um, is next to near impossible. But developers are happier because they get to do this stuff is, I think, the hands up to prove that point. So, so any general conclusions? There's two slides because I couldn't fit them all into one. There are some themes, um, which I didn't have this in the first time I did this. You don't get any of this for free because I kind of evangelically pronounced that all of this stuff we should start doing and we get it all for free. You don't get any of it for free. So you need to design for buildability. So it needs to be toolable. Every single bit of what you do needs to be toolable. If it's not, then it gets a bit harder. It's not impossible, it gets a bit harder. You need to design for deployable, deploy and undeployability. So that's a word I made up. But the interesting thing is with, because um, they're immutable, the stuff which you get with the bakery, if stuff doesn't go well when you put it into the live, live traffic in prod, you pull it back out again. So it needs to be undeployable automatically as well, which is nobody ever seems to do. Designed for modularity. So microservices are now the big buzzword. That's what you need to do. Monitorability, you need to really know what these things are doing. So if you're going to kind of trust a lot of stuff is just going to work, you need to know that it's just working. So that's all of the Church of Graph stuff. And you need to design for automatability as well. You need to design the fact that you're going to automate all of this stuff. Other themes, reduce variation. So we're not good at coping with lots of options. Um, so the less options we have, that's better. And the last one, trust developers. Because we have got ourselves into this mess, but I think if we're aware and we fess up to the fact that we've got ourselves into this mess, people might trust us to fix it. So what do we do? We can't apply all these ideas to all of our projects. And I definitely can't. But we, are ho we, where I work, are trying to apply some of these ideas in some small ways to some of the projects that we work on. And I think most people, maybe everybody here, could do the same thing. And what my kind of take-home message to everybody here is, um, think about what, how it is going to affect on your specific system. Because everybody's different. How is it going to affect how you architect and design stuff, how you build and test it, how you deploy and run it? It affects how you structure your teams, because I, I, all the developers love this, and then all the testers went, wait a second, my job's just changed. Um, how you interact, in our case, with our customers, but in your case, the people you build stuff for, and how you use and share code. And I think the real call to action is, what can you challenge? What can you find else that sucks? Because just taking these things, like reading the blog post and putting in a latency monkey, that's still not the... I think we need to try and push it up to the next level, which is what is the next latency monkey or simian army or church of graphs or whatever that we can come up with. So find stuff that sucks and get rid of it. Find stuff that's good and then make it better. And then share it, hopefully, because I'm OSS obsessed, and then get famous for it. So thank you very much. And I've got three minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? Or have I stunned everyone into silence? Anyone? How do you think it applies to stuff which is less rapidly evolving? So, yes, you're totally right. And the more you evolve, the more benefit you get. Um, so we, um, some of the stuff we do, it deploys like every year, every six months. But we try and iterate within that. So when we just, the feedback we get is less and we only get the feedback from um, like various test environments and stuff. But we try and get it from, we at least try and, test the fact that those things might work. So we, we, we try and build things so that testers can pull their own latest build of the code to their test environment. So it's not prod. I'm, nobody's going to let me deploy to prod on any of the projects I work on. But, but yeah, so we, let, we kind of do it in the test environments and suck it and see. 
And that's where it's more applicable and people are less concerned that we're going to break stuff. Any other questions? Well, yeah, you mentioned that uh, it makes sense to throw away some pieces on a regular, regular basis. Yeah. But uh, modern teams, they're not like stay constant for years. A new developer comes in to work for contract for six months and he leaves another one. So how, how does it work? The guy comes in and, well, he doesn't know project very well and, and everything is changing on his feet. So the question is, um, these days, uh, teams change very rapidly. And um, if you're changing stuff under their feet and they're also changing, how do you cope with that? Um, so I don't think, that's a good question, I don't think any of this addresses that. So we just try and do the clean code thing so that the theory is the code should just read and it's as simple and at the right level of abstraction as possible. And it's properly componentized so that if you replace things, you're replacing a small part and that the people, you know, all the things that consume that um, are aware it's quite clear what it is and what it's supposed to do. But that's a good question. I've run out of time. So thanks very much for coming. That was really good. That was